Hey everybody, this is Dr. Hathcock again. Uh, so with this, we're going to finish out our World War I topic. Uh, in class, I left off at the uh, Zimmerman Telegram, and we talked about uh, how the U.S. was entering the war as the Russians were, were withdrawing the war. Uh, and again, a big point there was the Eastern Front didn't exist anymore. Uh, as uh, the USSR, uh, as it's established in 1917, uh, signs a treaty with the Germans in Austria-Hungary, of the Central Powers period. So that closes down the Eastern Front, and all that stuff in the East was going to be sent to the West. Uh, so now going on to letter G and U.S. soldiers in World War I. Uh, let's start by looking at some of that technology uh, that uh, U.S. soldiers will be facing. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through this, uh, this slide, these various pictures, and then Talk about no man's land in the campaigns of 1918. So, sorry that took so long. I couldn't find my clicker there. Okay, so uh, no man's land is that area that was between the trenches. Uh, as it was said, no man could possibly live in that land between the trenches. Uh, you can see in the top left of our slide, we've got guys getting ready to go over the top. Uh, somebody would have blown a whistle, and those guys would have started running up and charging across no man's land. Uh, top right, you can see uh, that uh, you know, that's a picture that's taken just right at the exact moment where that guy's getting hit as he's running across no man's land. Uh, you know, something in the neighborhood of like 80% casualty rates. Uh, for those uh, units that did have to run across no man's land uh, to try to, uh, you know, break through the enemy's lines. Bottom left, we have aircraft involved uh, in a fight. And uh, bottom right, we have a, a section of France that looks like the moon uh, from years of uh, explosions, artillery, fighting. Uh, so, yeah, this was just a lot to ask of guys uh, to serve in those uh, here we have the machine gun. This is, uh, again, Mr. Hiram Maxim. Looked at him for a moment uh, in class on Monday. Uh, but, yeah, the machine gun was just so lethal, uh, especially once they figured out the water cooling system where it could go for uh, longer stretches of time. Uh, you know, they talked about the rhythmic wave of death as it is like the machine gun went left, people fell. As it went right, people fell. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a huge player in this war, uh, truth be told, in any conflict. Uh, but anyways, guys, we're going to have to deal with the machine gun. Uh, artillery in World War I was, uh, was more accurate. Uh, it was also more deadly. Uh, they started to put their artillery on uh, what's called a recoil system. So that when the gun would fire, the only thing really that would move was the barrel itself. Uh, everything else on the gun would sort of stay in place. So that allowed for better accuracy. Um, a better ability to aim at your enemy, if you will. Uh, you also had more rapid rates of fire. As really uh, World War I artillery, what you would do is open up the back door, uh, open up the back of the barrel, uh, put in a shell, put in a powder bag, close the door, lock it, pull a cord, and that would fire the artillery. Uh, then you'd open up that back door, uh, pop all that stuff back in, fire, fire. Uh, previous artillery was uh, much more cumbersome. Uh, you had to have a, like a whole team of men who would put in uh, powder, ball. You'd have a guy at the front with a big, uh, big long stick that would ram everything in. Then you'd have a guy in the back who would light, light the cannonball, or I'm sorry, light the cannon. Uh, and when those cannons fired, they uh, they tended to jerk back and get off of, uh, get a uh, sort of uh, off course of where they had been. So then you had to push them back to where they were, try to reevaluate and aim, and it just took longer. Uh, so yeah, World War I artillery was uh, much more accurate, uh, ra more rapid rates of fire, and uh, much more lethal at that. Uh, here we have uh, what's called the Paris gun. It's very German. Uh, the bigger the better, right? So they built this massive artillery piece that you can see here. Uh, the thing was so big it had to be uh, towed by train, by rail. Uh, bottom right hand corner you can see that's an actual sized human being standing next to one of the shells uh, that this thing fired. Uh, you know the guy who invented it he actually named it Big Bertha 
uh, he named it in honor of his wife. I don't know that she was honored uh, with that name and what was going on there, but uh, yeah, most people just simply refer to it as the Paris gun. Uh, it was horribly inaccurate. Uh, I mean, it would throw artillery like miles away, uh, but you couldn't aim it really. You just kind of like, were, okay, well, Paris is that way, so fire. Uh, a lot of times they wouldn't hit any like actual targets. It caused a lot of havoc in Paris. You know, they'd knock out old ladies' gardens and things like that. But, uh, you no, know, as far as an effective weapon of war, it just it really wasn't that. Uh, this is the first war where aircraft will be used. Uh, you'll have dogfights in the skies over Europe. Uh, you know, at first it was uh, just tail gunners, like you'd fly around and only the tail gunner could fire at somebody. Uh, but then they figured out a way to uh, put a machine gun in the front. Uh, this this is like very advanced stuff uh, then I'd say even now uh, to be able to fire a machine gun and not have the bullets take out your propeller in the front uh, you know scientifically they figured that out uh, also aircraft was used for reconnaissance you know you'd fly over the enemy's position and figure out how many guys were down below uh, then they also started using aircraft for what were called bombing runs where they would fly over the enemy's trench and just like start throwing grenades over the side down at the guys below. Uh, so yeah, aircraft will be used in this war. Uh, the tank was an invention of World War I. Uh, it was invented by the British, uh, first used in 1916. Uh, and you know, there was a lot of potential with the tank. Uh, it could be used to uh, act as a shield of sorts uh, when explosions took off or when an explosion happened. Uh, the tank being an armored vehicle could take a lot of that shrapnel, a lot of that hit. So you could put uh, soldiers inside of tanks, or you could have them walk behind tanks. Uh, the idea was try to get you guys across no man's land as intact as you could get them. Uh, then when you got close, you could break out and attack the enemy. Uh, the problem with the tank in World War I is that it was so slow. Uh, it was cumbersome, slow, um, you know, when the uh, British first used it, the Germans were a little bit terrified at first, like, oh, God, what is this? Uh, and then it's like an hour later, the thing is still lumbering across no man's land. And uh, the Germans just figured out real quick, all you have to do is uh, make your artillery go a little higher, uh, hit behind the thing, and you can take out any soldiers that might be back there. So, yeah, there was something here. There was a, there was potential with the tank. Uh, but in World War One, it just didn't really fully realize its potential. Uh, but in the next war, in World War II, uh, the Germans will figure out how to make the tank fast, uh, give it a real big punch. Uh, and in the next war, uh, tanks will be very effective, very deadly uh, in World War II. Uh, chemical weapons were heavily used in this war uh, by both sides, by the way. Nobody gets a free pass here. Allied powers, central powers, they all used art um, things like mustard gas and chemical weapons. Uh, whenever an, ar an artillery barrage started to happen, you had to get on your gas mask real quick uh, because you never knew if that artillery piece that was about to land, uh, it might have mustard gas inside of it. Uh, in fact, there's a story that towards the end of the war, uh, a corporal in the German army by the name of Adolf Hitler uh, actually had a mustard gas attack hit near him. Uh, story goes, Hitler was a little late in putting on his gas mask he did manage to get it on, but some mustard gas got into his lungs before he put the mask over his face. Uh, and it was just agonizing. Uh, you know, it was it was almost like torture. Uh, men who got hit by mustard gas attacks talked about how it felt like your lungs were on fire. Uh, and it was this constant fire that you never could put out. It's just a horrible thing uh, to get hit with this stuff. Uh, but Hitler did survive the mustard gas attack. Uh, he, you know, recovered. Can't help but think, you know, like another second or two more, uh, you know, you might not have had Hitler survive the war. You might not have had a World War II. Uh, those are what ifs. I'm not going to deal with all that. Uh, but another interesting thing is, uh, you know, Hitler used to have really a big mustache uh, in World War I. Uh, he had these, like, huge curling uh, mustaches. Uh, he felt like the big curly mustaches were what allowed mustard gas to get into his uh, uh, into his mask. That's probably not even a little bit true, but he felt that. Uh, so after the war, he cut off all of his uh, big curly mustache, and he just wore the little uh, the 
you know, what looks like a comb. Uh, people call it the Hitler mustache. Uh, so, yeah, he trimmed that up uh, there at the end of the war. Another is interesting point to make on uh, Hitler and chemical weapons. So in World War II, uh, the Germans did not use chemical weapons in combat. Uh, they did use them in concentration camps uh, horribly. Uh, you know, things like Zycom B were used uh, to kill people during the Holocaust. Uh, but in combat, out on the battlefield, the Germans never did use chemical weapons. Uh, a lot of people sort of theorize that uh, Hitler, having gone through a mustard gas attack, knew what it felt like. He also knew that if he used mustard gas, uh, uh, the Allied powers would would respond in kind and start using it against his soldiers. So, yeah, there's a, a lot of theories out there that maybe Hitler didn't use mustard gas in, or chemical weapons, period, on the battlefield in World War II because uh, he didn't want his soldiers to go through what he had gone through uh, at the end of World War I. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's a, a thing. Okay, a lot was asked of men uh, in this war. Uh, and this guy that you see here is, has been through too much. He's probably been at the front for way too long. And he's developed what uh, they call the long stare. Uh, what this guy is dealing with is post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Uh, it's by World War I that uh, clinically we start to diagnose PTSD uh, to understand what it is don't really understand how to uh, necessarily deal with it at that point. Uh, but uh, they started to understand at this time that, you know, combat doesn't just leave physical scars, it also leads, uh, leaves emotional scars as well, uh, so that they could sort of start the process of trying to treat uh, PTSD. Uh, you got a lot of that. Uh, a lot of the uh, guys, when they come home after World War I, uh, they're dealing with PTSD. They're, they're, you know, they're coming home with these psychological scars uh, from the Great War. And the trench itself was just a lot to ask of men. Uh, you know, these things, um, when it rained, they turned into rivers. And men would still be expected to stay there in the trench, in the weather, in the mud, in the rain, in the conditions. Uh, maybe you've heard of the term trench foot. Uh, that's when guys would be standing in those trenches in the water for too long. Uh, and they wouldn't dry their socks and their shoes. And, you know, their feet at some point would start to get that rot, uh, that so-called trench foot. Uh, even when they were dry, there were rats everywhere. There were insects everywhere. Uh, men were living underground in not so great conditions under the earth. Uh, but, you know, you had to go underground. You had to stay in the trench or you could get hit with shrapnel, machine gun fire, all manner of things. Uh, so, yeah, it really was a lot to ask you guys, uh, the ones who served in this war. Um, you know, whenever uh, whenever an enemy attack would happen, they would usually start with uh, artillery fire. And, I mean, you have scenes where, uh, you know, like the British would, uh, would, would fire off artillery for like two weeks straight. Just nonstop around the clock for two weeks, just uh, firing artillery at the German positions. And for two weeks, those soldiers had to go underground, stay in their bunkers. Uh, sometimes if a direct hit happened, uh, a bunker would collapse and cave in and men would be buried alive. Uh, so yeah, this really were, was very tough conditions to ask these guys to go through uh, trench warfare. So that's what American soldiers are walking into uh, as they enter into the Western Front. Uh, so that leading into those campaigns of 1918, uh, you know, at first, uh, when that year started, the Germans uh, threw everything they had into the Western Front. Remember, all that material that had been in the East was now moved over to the West. Uh, the Germans struck hard at the Western Front, pushed and gave it everything they had. Uh, but, but going into the spring of 1918, the German advances uh, stalled. Actually, I sh I'm sorry, I should say going into the summer of 1918. Uh, the Germans didn't push all the way through. Uh, there were moments when it looked like the Allied lines would fall, uh, but there would be American units to plug in a hole here, to plug in a hole there. So, you know, American units having arrived in Europe, they were fresh, uh, a little naive, a little green, if you will, but they hadn't been through four years of hell. And if, if nothing else, the American army was there to plug in holes, to hold the line, 
uh, to keep the Germans from breaking through. Uh, then in the summer of 1918, it was the Allies' turn to uh, strike, to push back. Uh, you know, they struck hard against the Germans, but the German lines held. So that heading into the fall of 1918, it was just the same old war. Uh, nothing had changed, just more attrition. Uh, you know, nobody breaking through anybody else's lines. Uh, but then in the fall of 1918, uh, this is what proved to be uh, the decisive moments of the war. Uh, it turns out by the fall of 1918, uh, the Germans, uh, they just don't really have anything left to fight with. Their population is starving, literally starving to death. Uh, the Germans have used up just about everything that they had uh, previously that year. Uh, so the Allies kind of kept waiting for the Germans to attack in the fall of 1918. They never did. Uh, so it was uh, the turn of the Allies to go ahead and push forward. And what they found was throughout October of 1918 uh, that the Germans were retreating. The Germans were pulling out of France, uh, getting closer and closer to the German border. Uh, so that by November of 1918, uh, the German army was pushed completely out of France. Uh, the Allies were then at that point posed to strike into Germany to attack, uh, invade Germany itself. Uh, but then on November the 11th, 1918, a ceasefire was called for. 11-11-1918, uh, uh, the fighting of World War I comes to an end. Uh, all does go quiet on that Western Front on November the 11th, 1918. So the Germans asked for a ceasefire, understanding that if the war continues, their country will be invaded. Uh, they do not have what it takes to uh, defend their homeland from that invasion. So November the 11th, 1918, the Germans uh, raised the white flag, call for an armistice, a ceasefire. Uh, so that then at that point, the fighting of World War I can come to an end. Well, it's also called an armistice, a uh, ceasefire or an armistice begins on November the 11th, 1918. Uh, with that, you have this, uh, this moment where the, the leaders of all the countries involved are gonna meet in the city of Versailles, France. And you can see it's there kind of in the middle of your outline uh, where it says the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, Versailles, France is the location for the uh, peace negotiations that'll take place at the end of the war. Uh, now, uh, America's president, Woodrow Wilson, uh, believed that this was a moment that called for leadership. Uh, so he himself uh, traveled all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, he himself went to Versailles, France to represent the United States of America at those negotiations. <clears throat> He'd be gone for uh, several months, uh, not quite a year, uh, but a good stretch of time he was gone from the country. And to this date, it's the, uh, the longest amount of time that a sitting president has ever been out of our country uh, when Wilson traveled to Versailles uh, to help negotiate this peace treaty. Now, the real question at Versailles was, how do you treat the central powers? Uh, the European powers who had been fighting for like four years, say England, France, Italy, uh, they want a real harsh settlement with uh, the central powers. They want Germany and Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire to suffer uh, for what's taken place here. Uh, they want it to be harsh, they want it to be punitive, uh, but the Americans and Woodrow Wilson felt very differently about that. Uh, Woodrow Wilson really was calling for an easy peace, uh, that it should not be such a harsh settlement. Uh, now Woodrow Wilson, if you'll recall, has a PhD. Uh, he had studied a uh, several things in college, not the least of which was American history. And Woodrow Wilson, as he traveled to Europe, said that he was thinking about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he was thinking about that malice towards none, charity for all approach uh, that Lincoln had tried during Reconstruction. You might recall his 10% plan that we talked about. So Wilson arriving in Versailles wanted an easy peace uh, because he so prophetically said, uh, if you're harsh in your treatment with these uh, with the central powers, they'll resent you for it. Uh, and he said, you'll be fighting this war all over again uh, if you treat them harshly. They probably should have ought to listen to Woodrow Wilson uh, there at Versailles, uh, because once the uh, treaty is handed down, 
Uh, it's not a nice treaty at all. It's extremely harsh. Uh, it's extremely punitive what the Allied powers will do. So the United States, Wilson wanted an easy peace. <clears throat> the uh, other European powers said, not so fast. We want them to suffer for what's happened. Uh, so in answering that question of how to treat the central powers, uh, European allied nations anyway, I will say that it needs to be a harsh peace. All right, so against that backdrop and knowing what was about to happen, uh, Woodrow Wilson issued or put forward this concept called the League of Nations. Uh, and the idea behind the League of Nations uh, was that it was going to be an international peacekeeping force that would prevent another great war from taking place. The League of Nations called for a lot of different things. Uh, it called for uh, free trade around the world. Uh, it called for the major powers of the world to meet, uh, to use words rather than weapons to uh, solve conflicts. So yeah, the whole point of the League of Nations was this international peacekeeping force uh, that would hopefully prevent great wars from happening in the future. Uh, all of the European powers were on board with the League of Nations ideals. Uh, even the Germans <clears throat> said that it was a good idea. So Europe as a whole was on board. Uh, but we'll talk about why the United Nations didn't join the League of Nations uh, here in just a minute. Okay, but when the Treaty of Versailles was handed down, uh, it was an extremely harsh settlement uh, that the Allies uh, gave to the Central Powers. Uh, it's a, a big moment in time. It's, uh, I don't know, it's got a lot of bearing on the future to come. So let me pull up this map and uh, look at what happened here with the Treaty of Versailles. Actually, let me try to get my dogs to calm down. So sorry. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. So, uh, in looking at the Treaty of Versailles, uh, one of the first points to be made is that the Germans uh, will be forced to accept guilt for the war. Uh, the Germans really didn't start this war. Uh, like I said in class, you could make the argument they could have stopped this war. Uh, but anyways, uh, point number one, the Germans will be given uh, guilt, responsibility for having started the war. Uh, with that, you then next point uh, had the central powers broken up into smaller countries. Uh, you can see here in Central Europe, there's a lot of new countries being born uh, out of the Treaty of Versailles. Germany itself is going to lose a lot of areas. Uh, you look at Austria, Hungary, there's just, it used to be such a big empire. <clears throat> now it's just these two little areas uh, there in Central Europe. Uh, but then you also have Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, you know, all these other nations coming to be. Uh, then if you look to uh, the Middle East, you'll see uh, that what had been the Ottoman Empire is broken up. Out of that, you get things like Turkey, Syria, Iraq, uh, places like that. Uh, so, yeah, the central powers are broken up into smaller countries as well. Uh, let's see, point number three. Uh, the Germans are going to be made to pay what are called reparations for the war. And the Germans are going to have to give up $33 billion uh, here at the end of World War I. So that's 33 B, big boy B, billion dollars that the Germans will have to uh, pay in reparations. Okay. Another thing that will happen is the Germans uh, will be forced to have a smaller military. Uh, their military will be limited uh, by the Allied powers. Basically, the Allies will let the Germans know like how big their army can be, how many tanks they can have, how much aircraft, things like that. And you go through the 1920s, you get into the 1930s, uh, you know, the Germans... Uh, they start to get very concerned about what's happening over in Russia or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, you know, communist Russia is talking about revolutions. It's talking about spreading the concept of communism. And Germans are very worried about defending their homeland and their country. Uh, they say, we need more tanks, we need more aircraft. Uh, but then here come the Allied powers saying, you know, actually, we're more scared of you than we are the Russians. So, no, you can't have more aircraft. 
and you can't have more tanks. So it really felt like from a German perspective that the West, uh, the Allied powers, uh, were not allowing them to, uh, to defend their homeland, uh, to provide for their own national security. Okay, uh, last not least, also the border between Germany and France uh, was to be what we call demilitarized. Uh, that is to say there wouldn't be any military there along the German and French border. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of harsh uh, things coming down. Uh, I really just scratched the surface of what the Treaty of Versailles called for. Uh, like the Treaty of Versailles is like 440 something pages long. Um, I'm not gonna go into 440 pages worth of information. Uh, but those are the major points to the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, you know, at first the Germans refused to sign it. Uh, you know, they said this is too much. They wouldn't sign it. Uh, but it was made very clear to the Germans that they could either accept the terms of the Treaty of Versailles or the Allies would invade Germany, uh, you know, and they would have to uh, taste what it was like to be invaded. Uh, so under that threat of an invasion, the Germans do accept the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, they do accept the stipulations and everything to come. Uh, so, yeah, the uh, this harsh settlement is brought down upon the Central Powers. And God's honest truth, uh, the seeds of World War II are planted uh, right there in that Treaty of Versailles. Uh, again, they probably should have ought to listen to old Woodrow Wilson uh, there at Versailles. <clears throat> okay, uh, but with the Treaty of Versailles in place, uh, Woodrow Wilson comes back to the United States. Uh, he's been involved in some high-level negotiations for months, uh, but Woodrow Wilson gets on a boat, comes back to the United States, uh, puts the uh, Treaty of Versailles before the United States Congress, and very quickly finds that America has concerns about the treaty. <clears throat> Americans also have concerns about this League of Nations idea. And Americans just didn't really feel like they needed to accept either of those things. Uh, when Wilson got back into the country. Uh, in fact, um, the Congress would not accept all of the uh, terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, one major point is the $33 billion that was assessed to the Germans. Uh, the United States refused that part of the treaty and just it said, you know, it's, it's too much. Well, we don't, we don't agree. Uh, it doesn't matter, later Hitler would still hate us anyways. But, uh, you know, the United States didn't want any of what it called that blood money. Uh, from the Germans at $33 billion. Uh, but in looking at the League of Nations concept, you know, the idea of an international peacekeeping force, uh, you know, Wilson really wanted the United States to join that thing. I mean, he's the creator of it. It's his, uh, it's his brainchild, if you will. Uh, but he found that Americans really didn't want to join the League of Nations. Uh, they didn't feel like it was vital to their national security. You know, Americans at the time said, hey, you know, we've got the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean to protect us. Uh, we don't really feel like we need to send our boys to serve under some French general in an international peacekeeping force, you know, in theory anyways. So, yeah, Americans just didn't feel that it was vital to their national security to join the League of Nations. Uh, the feeling was we'll just go back to being isolated and neutral <clears throat> and we'll let the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean protect us uh, from any possible wars. So uh, Wilson uh, at that moment realized that if the League of Nations was going to pass, uh, he needed to get out there and fight for that thing. Like he needed to get out there and whip up public support for the League of Nations. Uh, so in 1919, Woodrow Wilson got on a train. Uh, he traveled across the United States <clears throat> and he gave speeches uh, in an effort to try to whip up public support. Uh, this is a man who honestly needed a vacation. Uh, he'd been months in Europe negotiating uh, for the, the Treaty of Versailles. Now he comes home and finds that there will be no rest. He has to uh, go back to work, uh, try to get the country on board with this idea. So Wilson traveled by train. He gave two, three speeches a day, trying to whip up public support and opinions. Uh, but he finds himself in the town of Pueblo, Colorado, in September of 1919. Uh, and while he's uh, aboard his train car getting ready to give a speech there in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, President Wil Woodrow Wilson suffers a stroke. Uh, and basically, once the doctors calm him down, uh, you know, they manage to stabilize him, uh, President Wilson loses the ability uh, to use the left side of his body. 
Like he can't use his left arm or his left leg. Uh, his speech from that point to the end of his life was very slurred. It was hard to understand what he was saying. Uh, it's, it's a real tragedy on all levels. Uh, but if you think about it, like his greatest asset was public speaking. Uh, and that's robbed of him there in September of 1919. Uh, so with Wilson no longer able to go out there and give speeches and whip up support, uh, the fate of Wilson and the League of Nations are kind of tied together. Uh, the United States does not join the League of Nations. Uh, the League of Nations does not prevent another great war from taking place. <clears throat> and a lot of people argue that if the United States had been a part of the League of Nations, uh, then World War II could have been prevented. I don't agree with that assessment. I think the Treaty of Versailles and its its uh, stipulations are the real reason for World War II. And honestly, I don't think it would have mattered if the United States was a part of the League of Nations. Uh, once you forced all that down the throat of Germany, uh, you were going to have anger, resentment, and ultimately a war uh, coming out of Germany later on down the road. All right, well, that's it for this topic. Um, have a nice day. Bye.